Am I the only one? Am I the only one who sets their clock forward in their car five minutes? Be honest with you, I don't just set my clock forward in my car five minutes. Usually, I've got my clock set forward in my car about 12 minutes. My children are sitting here shaking their head up and down. <laughs> Why do we do that? Why do we set the clock forward in our car, whatever amount of time it is? Why do we do that? Because we think if we do that, it will ensure that we will get to where we're trying to go on time. But the, 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 the challenge of it is, is that everybody who gets into my car and knows me <laughs> knows that I have the clock set ahead. And so they know that's not the real time. That's just dad's time. And you know who else knows that? I do. I know I've got that clock set 12 minutes ahead. And so what do I do when I look at that clock? I look at that clock and I say, no big deal. I've still got 12 minutes. I can procrastinate just a little bit longer. You know, there's nothing wrong with setting the clock forward a little bit as a way to help yourself out. There's nothing wrong with doing that, to give yourself a little bumper. But what would be wrong would be if I was to set my clock ahead 5, 10, 15 minutes, and then when my children get into the car, to look at them and say, you're not on time. Why aren't you on time? The time says this. And that would be wrong because why? Because that time that's on that clock isn't the real time. It's just dad's time. But would be even worse than that would be if I wasn't to just say, you're wrong for not doing this, for not being on time. But if I was to say, you're wrong before God because you're not on time. You're not just wrong before God, you're unrighteous before God. And see, that's really what Jesus is dealing with here in Mark chapter 7, because the religious leaders, they have made these man-made rules. And at the beginning of Mark chapter 7, which was last week's reading, we remember, the religious leaders come to Jesus and they say, why is it that your disciples do not follow the traditions of the elders? They eat with dirty hands. They are defiled. Why don't they follow the traditions of elders? And so Jesus is responding to that today. And it's very important to understand what Jesus means when he says what he says and what Jesus does not say, but which has been included in Scripture. And we're going to, we're going to look at that in just a little bit. So... When the, when, when the religious leaders say to Jesus, your disciples are defiled because they do not eat with washed hands, they're making a very serious accusation against Jesus and his disciples. They're saying that these men are unrighteous before God, that they have taken into their bodies unclean food, and so then they have made themselves unclean by doing this. And so Jesus is responding to this, and Jesus says something that's very serious. He confronts it directly. He confronts it head on. And he says to them, he says to these religious leaders, you have taken away the word of God, and you have replaced it with your man-made tradition." And, and, and to understand what Jesus is talking about, you have to look at what these religious leaders have done. The word of God commanded that we would take care of our parents. And Jesus points this out. He says the word, the word of God says that you will honor your father and your mother. You will take care of them. We call that the fourth commandment today. 
But then he says to the religious leaders, but you teach people that if you will just give to the temple a gift, that it will be called what, we, what they said Korban was the name of it. It will be called Korban. It will be a gift unto the Lord. And that will get you out of taking care of your mom and dad. What a horrible teaching they had made. Why had the religious leaders done this? Because it was personally beneficial to them. If you've never seen an artist's rendering of the palace of the high priest of Israel in Jesus' day, it's quite something to behold. The palace that the high priest lived in was, was more extravagant than the palace of King Herod. I think if Joel Osteen was to look at that palace today, he might even get a little bit envious. You see, the priest had gone beyond just trying to create a little bumper around God's word. They had gone beyond just trying to help people be aware of when they were coming close to encroaching on God's word. They had gone well beyond that. They had gone beyond that to the point of saying, you're not right before God if you break our man-made traditions. And that continues to this day, 500 years ago in the church of Western Europe, there was a man-made tradition. There were a lot of them, actually. But this one man-made tradition in particular was that during the season of Lent, you could not say alleluia. You could not say alleluia. Because to say alleluia in, in the teachings of the church was disrespectful. Because Lent is a time to be somber, to be sad, to hate life, and, uh, and just to reflect on how miserable everything was for Jesus. And so you could not say hallelujah. And if you said it or if you sang it, you were not righteous before God. And there was this uh, pesky German monk who lived about 500 years ago. Uh, what was his name again? It was Martin, Martin Luther. That's right. And this, this is what Luther said. Now, I'm not going to read it for you in German. I'll give it to you in English. But this is what Luther said. Luther said, The gradual of two verses shall be sung either together with the Alleluia. Everybody say Alleluia. Either together with the Alleluia or one of the two, as the pastor may decide. We'll leave that for another time. Nor is it proper to distinguish Lent, Holy Week, or Good Friday from the other days, lest we seem to mock or ridicule Christ. Nobody wants to do that, right? I didn't think so. Luther goes on, for the Alleluia is the perpetual, what does perpetual mean? Is that like just like once in a while, certain time? No, perpetual is like all the time. For the Alleluia is the perpetual voice of the church. Why would the Alleluia be the perpetual voice of the church? Because we worship a risen Savior and King. You can read this for yourself in Luther's works, volume 53. Today, today, right now, if you were to go to lower Manhattan and you had really good eyesight and you knew where to look, you could walk around lower Manhattan and if you, if you looked in the right places, you'd see fishing strings. And you could follow this fishing string, and it, and it follows a map. And this might sound kind of fishy to you, but this is the truth. You could follow this fishing string, and it goes from building to building to building to building. And it makes, it makes an outline over a certain part of the city of Manhattan, lower Manhattan. And if you're fortunate enough to live inside of the fishing string then you live in what has been designated by the Orthodox rabbis today as a eruv. What's an eruv? An eruv is an area that the Orthodox rabbis have designated today as being an area that if you live inside of that, you do not have to follow the requirements of the Sabbath. Well, isn't that convenient? And they pay two rabbis $100,000 a year, and every Friday they go around lower Manhattan and they check to see is the fishing string still strung up correctly, and where it's not, they get a cherry picker out and they fix it real quick. And it's not just in lower Manhattan, it's in over 200 cities 
around the world. See, the heart, the heart of the matter is this, that we are made righteous before God by his grace, which is given to us freely through his son's atoning death and resurrection. And it is not now, nor thank God, has it never been about following man-made rules. Can we give God a praise clap for that this morning? <laughs> Amen. King David knew this. He talks about this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Psalm 51. We used it in the liturgy earlier. Let me read these words. David says these words, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. That's the heart of the matter. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for your love and for your mercy. We thank you, Father, for your word. Help us, Father, to turn and learn from your word. Help us to study your word, to grow in your word. Plant your word, Father, deep within our hearts and deep within our minds and nurture it and nourish it, Father, by the work of the Holy Spirit, by the means of grace, that, that your word would bear the fruit in our faith that you desire for it to bear. And help us, Father, to take the good news of salvation by grace and grace alone into a world that has always so desperately needed to hear it. And all of God's children, we all say, Amen. I want to begin with Mark chapter 7, 21 to 23. Jesus says this, he says, he's speaking to his disciples, he says, For from within, out of the heart, that's the heart of the matter, out of the heart of man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. When you go to see your doctor, your doctor may say, well, let's take a look at your chart. And he'll pop the chart. And, you know, back in the day, he might even take like your x-ray and he'd put it up on a light, you know, a screen. And he'd say, now let's look at, look at your x-ray. Let me tell you about it. And he'd start pointing out to it, you know, different things to you. And you'd kind of look like, like you knew what he was talking about. Oh, yes. And he'd say, and this and this. And he, oh, yes. And you don't know what you're looking at. You don't know who's X. That could be your mom's X-ray. That could be a cat's X-ray. You don't know. But the doctor say, no, it's this and this. And you say, oh, yes. Today, brothers and sisters in Christ, you are going to take a look at God's word and you are going to understand it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's something very important that we're going to look at today because in Mark chapter 7, Jesus is dealing with people who have added all these man-made rules and burdened all these people's consciences. And so it's so ironic that in the reading for today, we're going to find a whole sentence that's been added to the Bible. And it's nowhere in Scripture. And it has to deal with our relationship with God. And I'm going to point it out to you, and we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. Look with me at the text for today. Let's start at verse 18. Jesus is now in this house with his disciples. He's taught a very simple parable, but they don't get it. And so now he's kind of frustrated. And so we pick it up in verse 18. And Jesus said to them, to his disciples, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. Now look at that last sentence. Who does that refer to? I mean, just take it at its face value. Who does that refer to? Yeah, you think Jesus. And if you read that as it's written, thus Jesus, thus he declared all foods clean, you would think that, oh, well, Jesus has said we can eat whatever we want to eat. But here's the thing you got to understand. That whole sentence exists exactly nowhere 
in the New Testament. It's not a single Greek word that it's been translated from. That is completely and entirely the gloss, the addition of the translators. And isn't that ironic? Because here we are talking about what we're supposed to do and not supposed to do, and now there's a whole sentence added in talking about how supposedly he declared all foods to be clean, but that sentence itself is not even in the original text. And so then how did it get here? In the King James Version, the red letter King James Version, they ended, those translators ended this verse with these words, thus purging all meats. And then with time, with the more modern translations, then they changed it and they expanded upon it and they grew it into this. But what did Jesus actually say? Are you ready for this? You want to hear what Jesus actually said? Because it's a whole lot more interesting, I promise you. What Jesus actually said was this. When you sit on the toilet, now he's a guy talking with guys. It's sort of guy talk here. When you sit on the toilet, and literally in the Greek what Jesus says is, when you empty your cavity, your stomach is what we would say, when you expel that food that you ate, so that's number two, right? When you, this is what Jesus literally said. When you sit on the toilet and do number two, you cleanse your bowels. That's actually what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say anything about declaring all foods clean. You see, the, the, and why am I bringing this up? Because there are people today who will say what? Well, Jesus said we can eat whatever we want to eat. No, he did not. Not here he didn't. He did not say that here. This has nothing to do with being able to eat whatever you want to eat. It goes back to the very first verse in Mark chapter 7 where the religious know-it-alls come to Jesus and they say, why aren't you wash, eating with washed hands? When you eat with unwashed hands, you make yourself defiled, unrighteous before God. And so now Jesus is speaking to that in this context. That is what this has to do with. Please remember, Matthew chapter 5, we read this. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. No, I came to what? To fulfill the law. That's exactly right. So you see, the religious leaders are being very nasty in Mark chapter 7. They're telling Jesus and his disciples, you are defiled. And when you study that word defiled, it's really a nasty thing that they're saying to Jesus. In the, common, in the classical Greek in that day, to be defiled meant to make something common. But in biblical usage, it's used 15 times. And to be defiled in the Bible means something much more serious. It means that you're no longer righteous before God. So later in the book of Acts, when these, many of these same religious leaders haul Peter and Paul and others up in front of the Sanhedrin and they accuse them of doing things, they will say to them these words in Acts 21, verse 28. They will accuse Paul in this way. They'll say, to him, they'll say about him, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled the holy place. That's what they're saying, Jesus, is that he is defiled and his disciples are defiled. And this is a horrible thing that the religious leaders are saying about Jesus' disciples. How horrible to say, you have made God's house defiled because you brought into God's house people from a different race, people from a different ethnicity. We should always remember that Solomon's temple, the original temple that was built with the blueprint given by God, Solomon's temple had no segregated area for non-Jewish people. All people were to be there in the temple together. This segregated area was added by King Herod when he built the temple, when he was trying to get points from the religious leaders and know-it-alls. And so Jesus then responds with these words in verse 23. He says, all these evil things come from within. We're not made evil by, by, by eating with unclean hands. No, we are evil because of things that come from within. And where from within do these things come? From our heart. And why does our heart produce evil thoughts? Because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. When we fell into sin, 
we, we were corrupted, our nature was corrupted, and our hearts, when we are born into this world, we are born at enmity towards God. Our hearts are dead before God, and only the love of Christ can fulfill, can abolish the requirements of the law. And here's the great news. Jesus doesn't care about what's in our bellies. Jesus cares about what is in our hearts. We don't have to fake our faith anymore. We don't have to live a checklist Christianity. Have I done all these things? Have I not done all these things? No, we have freedom because of what Christ has done for you and I. Can we give God a praise clap for that this morning? See, Jesus, I'm going to wrap it up with this. Jesus always focused on relationships, not regulations. And it drove the religious leaders crazy. We see over and over again, for example, the healing on the Sabbath of the man with a shriveled hand in Mark chapter 3. They hated Jesus for healing somebody on the Sabbath, but Jesus was more concerned about relationships than regulations, for eating with sinners like he did in Matthew chapter 9 when he ate at Matthew's house. Again, Jesus put relationships ahead of regulations for letting a sinful woman anoint him in Luke chapter 7. Because for Jesus, it was always about the heart of the matter. We have a great mission statement as a church that we're going to glorify God by spreading the gospel. And we're going to spread the gospel by focusing on three things. We're going to focus on our, say it with me, on our preaching, on our teaching, and on living our daily lives. And the heart of the matter is really about what it is to live your life as a Christian, to live in the freedom that God's grace gives to us. In the liturgy for today, we use Psalm 51. And it's one that we use as Lutherans often. We quote verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12. But almost always as Lutherans, we stop a verse too early. Because really it goes on then in verse 13 to say something that we really should take note of and we should reflect on and we should seek to achieve by God's grace in our lives. Let me read Psalm 51, verse 13, which says this. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. Who did David say? Whose ways? Your ways. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's what we need to be about, not just in the sanctuary, but every day during the week is telling others about what the Word of God actually says and about how we're in a right relationship through grace, not by works. It is not of ourselves. It's a gift from Him. That is the heart of the matter. Amen? Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep all of our hearts and all of our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.